You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Monday. November 12th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Yochai Blankler, Harvard Law professor, author of Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation, and radicalization in American politics. Also on the program today, it's Veterans Day observed. And on the actual Veterans Day, Trump reminds us that nothing means anything anymore. Meanwhile, Rick Scott and the Republicans pretend something nefarious happening in Florida and in Arizona as recounts begin in Florida in earnest. In Georgia, Stacey Abrams sues looking to count provisional ballots, of all things. Meanwhile, 31 dead in raging California wildfires. And in Brazil, the army chief cops to threatening the Supreme Court to jail Lula. Meanwhile, Ice imprisonments hit an all-time high, while 5,200 U.S. military personnel at border are doing $200 million worth of nothing. U.S. to stop Saudi refueling above Yemen in a completely meaningless gesture. Dems, meanwhile, prepare for investigations of the Trump administration and the besieged and apparently highly investigated Matt Whitaker says he won't cut Mueller funding. And lastly, we have our first candidate for 2020, folks. Richard Ojeda, former West Virginia congressional candidate, throws his hat in for the Democratic nomination in 2020. All this and more on today's program. I'm fidgeting around in my seat. I just uh, got a a little bit of uh, my uh, sciatica acting up. Uh, Maybe that's because... Maybe that's because um, I really don't want to talk about 2020 yet. And so... We're going to attempt to... Um, we have a new rule about this. Yes. Well, I mean, it's, it's a new rule only because we're stating it now. But it's a uh, long-standing rule, which, of course, is you always wait until the lame duck session is over before you talk about the upcoming... Oh, uh, the upcoming... It's opioids. The upcoming 2020 election. Yeah. No. Uh, Brendan just brought Brendan's me over some Advil, you. and he brought me 12. <laughs> Which is fine. Yeah. I mean, I can take you. Go, can take, go. We don't want to hear you bitching no, today, I boss. I appreciate it. I really do. That's what Brendan. Do. Brendan's the muscle guy. Brendan's like, oh my god, he's gonna whine and bitch and moan all fucking day. <laughs> Get him as many pills as possible so he doesn't do the friggin' thing all friggin' day. Um. So that is the, the rule around here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in regards to the um. Uh, the twenty twenty elections. But uh, I'm sure that we will uh, end up uh, breaking that rule. Uh, but we will attempt to to not. Um, so, folks, uh, today is the day when Veterans Day is um, celebrated. Yesterday uh, was um, Veteran, I guess, the actual Veterans Day. Um, Veterans Day, uh, if my if I am not mistaken, started in this country. In many other countries, is known as Armistice Day, and I believe that we uh, used to also call it um, Armistice Day here. And then we realized, like, oh, okay, um, we've got too many wars, so we're just going to include all veterans, um, uh, all military uh, veterans. Um, 
But uh, Donald Trump uh, flew to France outside of uh, Paris, um, uh, I guess, at the beginning of the weekend, ostensibly to celebrate or commemorate, I guess, um, Armistice Day, what uh, most of Europe calls Armistice Day, we call Veterans Day. I guess we switched that in uh, 54. Um, It is supposed to commemorate the anniversary of the end of World War I. And we're now, I guess, at 100 years. And uh, Donald Trump flew to France, and then apparently it was raining. So he didn't go to the cemetery for the ceremony. He ultimately came out of his shell. Nobody's quite clear on why that is. I mean, aside from him being Donald Trump and uh, completely disrespectful. And I have to tell you that, like, you know, to to a certain extent, um, I have a little bit of ambivalence about Veterans Day. We should not be creating more veterans at any point. Uh, with that said, you have people who gave up their lives, gave up their health, families who lost uh, loved ones, and that should be recognized. Um, because that's a crappy situation to be in, to say the least. Uh, So uh, those people deserve our respect. And certainly, you know, when the president is going to uh, a cemetery, that represents the death, uh, essentially, of millions of people. Um, You'd expect maybe some measure of sacrifice on his part. Uh, If he was even remotely a normal human being. But the president is not. And here's an example of it. Even as he's reading off some of the vets who are with them, of course, not uh, World War I vets, but uh, World War II vets, he can't help but think about his situation at that very moment. We have a number of amazing veterans with us today including six veterans of World War II. James Blaine. James, where is James? James, thank you. Thank you, James. Frank DeVita. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. You look so comfortable up there under shelter (laughs) as we're getting drenched. You're very smart people. Pete Dupre. There you go. I can't help but look at you, think of all the suffering and the millions of people who died, and then remember it's about me getting wet. Um, And look, I'm not um, a huge fan of uh, Macron's politics, but um, it's uh, I can appreciate the fact that he took the time to, um, at the very least, subtweet and humiliate Donald Trump uh, in some fashion. Uh, as as subtle as it was, um, Macron got up, gave a, a speech. I'm not sure if this was at the same location. Um, I don't know that it was, but there was a couple of uh, events, obviously, around um, around Paris. And uh, here he is, Macron, speaking about the difference between nationalism and patriotism. I imagine he uh, was quite aware of Donald Trump's now proclivity to call himself a nationalist. Cette vision de la France comme nation généreuse, we'll de la France comme pro- I should probably read the. Um, we should probably do the. Um, uh, d- put the volume Live down. Translation you know. right. by uh, Sam Cedar. Right, and I, I have to tell you, I je ne parle pas français. I am reading uh, the translation that's there. Fellow people of France. Here we go. <laughs> Just going to make it up. Here it is. All right. So it's uh, this vision of France. Continue. As a generous nation with a vision which carries universal values has been in those dark times exactly the opposite of the selfishness of a people which looks only at its own interests because patriotism is the exact opposite of nationalism. Nationalism is the betrayal of patriotism. 
By saying our interests first and never mind the others, you erase what is the most precious to a nation, what makes it exist, what makes it great, what is the most important, its moral values. And then uh, Trump has a little bit of a scowl on his face. I don't know if that's coming up right at that moment, but um, it's quite clear who Macron is speaking to at that moment. The primetime MSNBC lineup. Right. Rachel, exactly. Chris, all of them, they like me very much. My people loathe me. I have no approval rating. I'm destroying the unions, but uh, MSNBC very much. Right, but MSNBC is not going to help him. I mean, I think on some mm. level uh, there is Oh, value. this could help him in his domestic politics. <clears throat> it yeah. could very well. And, you know, it is, it is a problem for the United States long term that in France you can help yourself domestically by attacking uh, the president of the United States. I mean, that is going to have long term implications. You know, regardless of what it is, there was... Um, you know, we didn't talk too much about the Acosta, Jim Acosta, Donald Trump, um, you know, circus. But the bottom line is you see things like um, on Friday, Duterte's government is going to charge a veteran journalist and her online news startup with tax evasion. Um, they're going to... Uh, basically try and indict Maria Ressa, a reporter. And it's clear that they're doing it because she's critical of the government. And so when Donald Trump sets these markers down where it's okay for him to attack reporters in the way that he does, he's sending a message to these other worse regimes that like, look, you're not, I'm certainly not going to be the one to hold you to account for this. When Saudi Arabia chops up a journalist in an embassy, they do so because they think they have the latitude to do that. And frankly, if it was up to Trump, they would have. Remember, I mean, remember his first reactions. And you're not going to see these reactions uh, in this country to what happens in the Philippines. And you're not going to see it in, in countries all around the world. I mean, this is what the State Department would have done, and they would have registered something that would have been, and, and there would have been a sense of like, we have a certain amount of latitude. When the uh, United States walks away from maintaining certain principles, at least even like projecting that publicly. And of course, they don't, you know, uh, this is not to say that the United States doesn't um, support oppressive regimes. Of course, we have, we do. But even when the most basic of standards are washed away, even when the norms, even when the pretense, even if that's all it is in many instances, the pretense, it has bad, it is washed away. It has bad implications. So uh, we should keep that in mind um, for a while. Meanwhile, folks, big corporations are getting rich from selling your data. Congress has completely failed to save net neutrality or protect your privacy online. Now, Internet providers and mobile carriers like Comcast and Verizon are free to restrict websites, spy on your online activity, sell your browsing history to advertisers. But with one click, ExpressVPN shields your online activity from Internet and mobile providers. Nice. ExpressVPN is easy to use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, phone and tablet. ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your Internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. That has all sorts of uses, uh, folks. Including a tremendous amount of security. Get ExpressVPN protection for less than $7 a month. It's rated number one VPN service by TechRadar and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you ever use public Wi-Fi and want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is the solution. I mean, look, um, there was a time, I think, back in the day where if you use a VPN, I mean, people would do it for like business mm -hmm. quite a bit. But if you were a personal, uh, you know, like an individual and you use VPN, 
people, you know, people in the know would be like, hey, you're a little bit paranoid. Um, these days, based upon how much data is settled, I was talking to Kyle. Kyle has basically taken all apps off his phone. The guy who develops our app. You know what uh, William S. Burroughs said? What's that? He said, a paranoid is someone with all the facts. Right. Well, the bottom line is all your apps are following you. They're selling your data, whether you have them on or off at any given time. Uh, oh, my God. I had such a creepy experience with that over the weekend. What was it? Your phone is totally listening to you. I bought a robe, a fuzzy robe with a hood with ears on it Respect. at a thrift store in the middle of nowhere. Right. And I said something about how I liked it at some point in time. Next day, my Instagram feed serves me an ad for a fuzzy robe with a hood with ears on it. That's weird. And I'm Very constantly creepy. fed. I, I had no idea where these anti-Semitic Should ads we? were coming from. Yeah, right. And I realized, wait a second, they're, my phone's listening to my salmon fresh. <laughs> Chablis ads and yoga. Uh, I do get a lot of yoga, yoga, folks, Chablis, and protocols of the elders. Take back your internet privacy today. Find out how you can get three months free. Go to expressvpn.com slash majority. That's express, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash majority for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash majority to learn more. And remember, um, oh, okay, yeah, folks, you know that there are uh, job sites that send you tons of the wrong resumes to sort through and make you wait for all the right candidates to apply to your job. That's not smart. But you know what is smart? Go into ZipRecruiter.com slash majority to hire the right person. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. Brendan knows this. Brendan is, uh, we. Uh, there are some days we just make Brendan just, we just refer to him as the Zip Recruiter hire. Hi, Brendan. I'm here from Zip Recruiter. You need it's, any gel caps? It's, prof- it's powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply so you get more qualified candidates fast. We used Zip Recruiter when we hired Brendan, yeah. and it was a wealth of riches. No more sorting through the wrong resumes. No more waiting for the right candidates to apply. That's why ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. And, folks, it was I am, I am not the most organized person. This made it so easy. This made it so easy. And now my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter, the smarter, smartest way to hire. And ladies and gentlemen, as you can see today, I am almost fully shaven. I shaved. When did I shave? Maybe it was Saturday or, or yeah, I think it was Saturday. Uh, well, you know how I shave, folks. Listen, we're getting close to uh, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa. Gift shopping for him can seem impossible. Thankfully, Harry's makes long-lasting quality products at a super reasonable price with sets just starting at 10 bucks. And if he doesn't love it, returns are quick and hassle-free. For years now, going on years, I have told you my favorite uh, things about Harry's. The razor handle... Sent to my door when they narrowed the uh, the blade head. That was very important to me to get it up into the nostril area. I don't need to give you too much information, but a little people see my face all the time. Um, as a special offer for fans of the show, we've partnered with Harry's to give you five bucks off any shave set, including our limited edition holiday sets. When you go to Harry's dot com slash majority port, plus you'll get free shipping. The offer is for new and returning customers. Usually it's if you're a new customer. This is for new and returning customers, only available for the holidays. Each Harry shaving set comes with the ergonomic weighted handle with an option to engrave, German-engineered five-blade cartridges that provide a close, comfortable shave, foaming shave gel for rich lather, a travel cover to protect your blades, a handsome holiday gift box. Or get something for yourself. Redeem a Harry's trial offer to experience the quality of shave before committing. Get your holiday shopping done early. Free shipping ends on December 12th. So act now. Go to harrys.com slash majority port. Get $5 off a shave set while supplies last. That's harrys.com slash majority report. All right, quick break. When we come back, Yochai Benkler.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Yochai Benkler. He is a uh, professor from Harvard Law, the Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies uh, there, author of uh, multiple books, including his most recent with, uh, with co-authors, uh, Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation, and Radicalization in American Politics. Uh, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. Happy to be with you. So um, let, I, I want to start, um, uh, I guess let's start with just the the um, the methodology of the research that, that offers, the, the, that provides the foundation for the book. And then I, I want to uh, start with the history before we get to what your research found. But but just give us a sense of what kind of research um, you were doing uh, that, that, that formed the basis of this uh, book. So we at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, with our colleagues at the Center for Civic Media at MIT, have been developing a platform to analyze media ecosystems generally using very large data analysis. Essentially, we scrape and collect millions of stories, about a million stories a day from around the world, and we build it into a system that then allows us to search for more stories on a given topic, put them in a database, and allow us to uh, analyze uh, millions of stories, how they link to each other, what text they use on which day, how they are tweeted, how they are shared on Facebook, or at least how often they're shared on Facebook, um, and with these materials, we then also add case studies where we do a deep dive into a particular topic, look at how television covered it using the Internet Archive, uh, uh, TV Web Archive. Um, and this particular study, this particular book, is based on analyzing 4 million stories from April of 2015 until the first anniversary of the Trump presidency, has very heavy focus on the presidential election uh, up until the election, and then more broadly on national politics uh, since then. And this um, this dynamic um, is not well. All right, let's let's go to let's cut to the quick in terms of the the broad strokes. In the course of your research, you essentially found that there are two. Um, large subsets of, of media consumers uh, within politics, um, the right and the, and the and essentially the the center and the left as as the second one. Tell us what the distinctions are between those two subsets. So what we found is even more than just that the consumers are in two separate groups, but that the producers too are in two separate groups. So. When you look at how media producers link to each other, that's to say, this has nothing to do with Facebook, nothing to do with Twitter. It's only, I'm writing a story, I'm publishing it online, I'm linking to other stories. This is something about how I, as the producer, am deciding who I give authority to, who I give credit to, and who I don't. And we also used how often uh, sites were tweeted together. So, for example... If I'm somebody who tweeted a story from the New York Times and tweeted a story from the Washington Post on the same day, our network analysis would make the New York Post, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post close to each other. If I tweet Breitbart and Fox News on the same day, then Fox News and Breitbart will be on the same day. And that shows us the consumer side, what they're paying attention to. What we saw both when we analyzed open internet, web-based linking, and when we looked at Twitter, and when we looked at Facebook, and even when we focused on text and how who uses similar text, what we saw was a repeated pattern. The right wing going from Fox and the New York Post all the way to uh, uh, Alex Jones and InfoWar and Gateway Pundit and Truthfeed and True Pundit and the craziest conspiracy sites, all have a single network. There are single insular networks where the producers link mostly to each other and the consumers read mostly that. 
By contrast, we didn't see anything parallel on the left. Instead, what we saw was all the way from relatively historically conservative center-right, at least editorially, uh, uh, publications like the Wall Street Journal, all the way to mobilized networks publication like Daily Kos or historical left-leaning publications like um, uh, Mother Jones, are all actually part of the same media ecosystem. They're all anchored in traditional media. They all link primarily to traditional media, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, uh, etc. They all, their audiences also have a much more diverse media diet, and they read much more broadly across from left to center. So we don't really see a symmetric polarization where the left and right are each going off in its own way. What we see is that the right has spun off into its own insular system, and the rest has essentially become a single media ecosystem. And there's almost no center right. There are almost no publications that you would today, historically were right, but today would you consider center right, National Review, Weekly Standard, um, uh, basically get no attention. Um, Alex Jones today has a bigger audience than any of these historically conservative publications. There is no center right. There's just a right and the rest. And so what what are I mean, let, let's let's talk about the implications of of the 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 narrowness of the the media, I guess, diet and network. So both from a consumer and a production side, the narrowness of of the right. Let's talk about the implications of that first before we get in or maybe it's easier to talk about it the implications relative to the diversity on the center center left. Essentially what we saw uh both in general in the structure and when we dug into specific case studies was that the right operated on what we came to call the propaganda feedback loop. That is to say, each of the outlets on the right has to compete on ideological purity and being and feeding its audience more identity and bias confirming news. Whereas nobody on the right has any incentive and in fact is strongly incentivized against saying, no, that's false. Actually, that's going too far. Let's be a little moderate. So... What you don't see at all on the right is competition that is moderated by fact-checking and reality-checking. The, the only way to differentiate yourself is to continue to be loyal to the identity-confirming narratives and to criticize others who step out of line. What we saw in the rest of the media ecosystem, including on the left, is that even when a crazy conspiracy theory did take root for a little while, because the audience pays attention to, to such a diverse set of media, because the media that get the most attention operate on a journalistic model that is fact-checking constrained, because even many of the outlets that are left-oriented operate in that journalistic model, the conspiracies don't survive long, and instead there's a tension between, on one hand, trying to get audiences by uh, confirming their biases, which happens on the left as well, and on the other hand, not going too far out of line from what's reality, because then you get criticized from other sites uh, uh, that the left pays attention to. So the right operates purely on a propaganda feedback loop where they only repeat the same bias-confirming truths and nobody tries to constrain the other. Whereas on the left, you see a tension between efforts to confirm people biases and make them feel good about the news, and at the same time being constrained by the fact that everybody still focuses on a reality check dynamic. And we should say that this not only applies, I mean, to the, the media outlets themselves, but also to, theoretically, to the politicians, right? I mean, because they end up being, um, you know, in, in the, 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 all of the, I guess, the actors within 
what you could consider sort of the conservative world or the center center left world. So when I'm, you know, even if I'm speaker of the house, I, I've got to deal with essentially Fox news and everything that's around it. So I also have to, the, all of my incentives are to at the very least either be quiet or to actively confirm and support these sort of other narratives. That's absolutely right. And, and again, we see this in the data. Essentially, think of it as a, as a three-way um, uh, interaction. Media outlets want audiences, and the audience gets attention, brings attention by enjoying the stories that confirm their beliefs. Politicians want audiences, and they want to confirm their beliefs because they also are attracted. Now, if the media outlets will always support and amplify what a politician who only says what audiences want to hear uh, does, is that that politician gets airtime. A politician that says, you know what, that's going too far, that's not true, um, will at best lose attention and lose their audience and their media outlets, and at worst be vilified and actually have the news outlets um, um, attack them for being um, um, too soft, as it were. And so essentially you have this three-way network of audiences, police media outlets, media outlets, police each other, and police politicians to all toe the party line. Instead, what you have with the rest of the media ecosystem that covers the center, center left and left, is that the outlets identify politicians who are lying and criticize them as well. Um, the politicians who want to compete on being reality-based actually have an audience that can tell the difference between truth and fiction rather than just between what fits and doesn't fit the party line. So the politicians face completely different media and audience incentives on the left than on the right. The outlets face completely different incentives and sources of discipline. And the audiences, therefore, face a completely different media ecosystem. And on the right, there's simply reinforcement of towing the party line and competing on who can do it in a more pure and extreme way. Whereas on the left, you get this balance between trying to appeal to your uh, voters' preferences, but at the same time being constrained by a media ecosystem that will hold you to the facts of what you say. So what what... What accounts for this difference? I mean, this is because and, and I think I mean, the, I mean, is it is it simply I mean, what accounts from, from to the extent that you have a sense, what accounts for this difference? So the first thing that we need to learn from this difference is that most of current debates about what's happened to American political media has focused on technology, whether it's the Facebook algorithm or fake news clickbait uh, uh, spammers, or whether it's uh, uh, Russian bots, uh, or, or most of the stories, whichever they were, had a strong technological component. Because both of these populations are actually at the same technological frontier. And in fact, if you look at use surveys, People on the left are younger generally and therefore use the technology more, whereas people on the right depend more heavily on traditional media like television and radio. Um, you can't keep blaming the technology. That's not where most of the action is. Instead, you need to look at a story that you can't find from our data. And in the book, what we do is we step away from the data and we start looking at the history of the last 50 years of media policy, of political culture, of technology. And the story we tell actually has very little to do with Facebook's algorithm and a lot to do with what allowed Rush Limbaugh right. to invent the outrage industry as a major new business model that makes millions. 
And so, I mean, let's 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 talk about that, because, you know, having been a I guess an AM talk radio uh, vet uh, that entered into this in many respects to specifically deal with Rush Limbaugh at a time, you know, when YouTube did not exist, when Facebook was something that just like college kids maybe, you know, vaguely knew uh, Twitter did not exist at that time. This was the dynamic the, the in some respects to the extent that we had a precursor to social media, radio, talk radio was it in many respects. So, I mean, I think people uh, are familiar with what happened with the Fairness Doctrine being rolled back. It allowed for uh, Rush Limbaugh to go on three hours a day. But what else was it? What, why? Why did the right adopt that model and the left never really pursued it or was it i mean how conscious of a, of an activity was it by the right to pursue this so i think there are um several elements that we explain uh in the chapter on the origins of asymmetry in the book um and first of all uh there's a component that has to do with the political realignment of the Republican Party. Essentially, after 68, with the adoption of the Southern strategy, you see a shift of a strong component of the Republican coalition becoming a white identity audience that is captured within the Republican Party because it's rejecting the civil rights movement. Then in the 70s, you see evangelical Christians who were uh, present but not politically mobilized, being mobilized by the success of the women's movement to protect a traditional patriarchal family and resulting in the rise of the moral majority. These two audiences, the Christian evangelicals who got into it through televangelism and the Christian broadcasting network that was the third most watched uh, radio network in the 1980s, um, uh, and uh, Christian broadcasting alongside Rush Limbaugh and talk radio um, uh, created a base of, um, of within the audience that was a large coherent group that provided a commercial audience for this model. The second thing that happened is that in 1996, in addition to the repeal in 1987 of the Fairness Doctrine that you mentioned, in 1996 there was also repeal of group ownership rules that allowed Clear Channel to emerge as a major player in radio, that allowed Sinclair to emerge as a major player in broadcasting, companies whose names you don't really know, but that actually, in the case of Clear Channel, owned stations from coast to coast, including buying uh, uh, the producer of Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, uh, Hannity on radio. So now you essentially have a seamless network of radio stations, coast to coast, practically 24 hours a day, selling this outrage and hatred as a, a, a form of candy, essentially. It makes you feel good about your identity if you agree with it, and you tune into it, and it draws you in, and it make, gives you a sense of community in this base anchor. So the right moved early, the right relied on deregulation and the emergence of technologies of abundance, be they AM, ra AM radio first, then increased channel capacity, and later on the internet, to harvest the benefits from this new audience. On the left, you had, uh, first of all, the fact that the right moved first meant that traditional journalistic outlets also gave political confirmations to people on the left. The more that the right was stuck in its propaganda and feedback loop, the more just telling things how they are already reinforces you as somebody who's left uh, in your beliefs, because now you're getting all of the benefit of mainstream journalism turning toward um, um, the, the right and saying that's false. So that was one element, the fact that the right was a first mover, it's entirely possible, at least in theory, that had the left moved first, it would have been uh, reversed. Um, the other thing is that the coalition on the left is much more diverse and doesn't have this very large coherent center of white identity and Christian 
uh, uh, voters, and instead has, so if you look at radio, uh, black communities are largely considered a market uh, of their own. Latinx communities are largely considered uh, of their own. NPR is largely a highly journalistic organization, but with an editorial tilt or a feel uh, that serves uh, uh, and reinforces left uh, beliefs in that regard, more like the Wall Street Journal, obviously, than like Fox. Um, so for somebody like Air America to come along, for MSNBC to suddenly rechange its um, um, practices in 2006, uh, they're already competing with for an audience that is getting some of its partisan kicks simply from truth-seeking journalism. They're aiming for a much more broad and diverse audience without the same core of what uh, uh, provides the bread and butter of the right-wing media. And by the time the Internet sites come along, uh, on the right, the outrage industry has been uh, around for 20 years. The audience knows what to expect. You can't compete anywhere else. On the left, it becomes much harder to compete completely separate from reality, and instead we see this more constrained uh, partisanship, even from outlets that try to be more partisan. Let, let me uh, just bounce this this um, uh, theory that uh, pet theory of mine that I've had for some time in terms of like e- e- explaining the development of this, and I wonder if any of your research or just your your thoughts just in in general um, that on the right there is a, a, aside from the structure that they have built. Just uh, broadly speaking, there's a lot more money available for this type of stuff. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Rush Limbaugh and and all of uh, right wing talk radio on some level is subsidized by ideological money. I mean, maybe we can, you know, uh, whether it's the Heritage Foundation or through Hillsdale College or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, and, and broadly speaking, I think we see that on the on the right uh, uh, online as well. Is there a difference in the incentive structure of just the 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 audiences and the producers? Um, is it you know on the left? It seems to me much of the material of the center center left is you know generated from academia, where the where the incentive structure, where the reward system is slightly different than on the right. On the right, it seems to be. How effective can you be at entering certain things into the uh, the the um, society's media bloodstream? On the uh, on I mean, excuse me, on the right and on the left, it is how sound is your reporting, or how uh, sound you know does it withstand scrutiny? And that those fundamental uh, differences in the the way that one as a producer gets. Uh, compensated just by, you know, peer respect versus actual dollars in, you know, uh, adds to this dynamic that's already existing. So I think it's important to separate two very distinct phenomena. For me, based on our research, the major transition point on the belief structure on the right had to do with the fact that Rush Limbaugh found a new business model because big money supported right-wing publications from right after World War II on. Essentially, if you look at uh, the National Review, Nicole Hammer has a beautiful book called Messengers of the Right that looks at that first generation of post-war right-wing media And what she shows there is that they essentially never became a business model. They sold some, they had relatively low circulation, and they relied partly on reader or listener contributions and partly on contributions from rich benefactors, exactly the model that you're describing. What was new about Rush Limbaugh, what was new about Fox News, is that they no longer depended on that kind of politically mobilized um, um, money, but instead actually found a business model that drew audiences 
that were loyal enough and large enough to actually make it big advertising business. So there, on the media side, I'm not persuaded by the story that it's about big money paying for them to do it, rather than the just that they were able, because of all the reasons I described, to turn right-wing mobilized media from a partisan, narrow, and money, a big money-funded enterprise into mass media, big business, and now online, clickbait and, and online advertising business. What is, I think, correct about what you say is the flow of, shall we call it, um, uh, higher status uh, or, or, or research, not status so much as, as, as research type work, where essentially from right after the war uh, with um, uh, the, Her- no, the World War II, uh, I mean, with the Heritage Foundation, with the Foundation for Economic uh, 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 Freedom, um, uh, and going through Cato, and, and, uh, but particularly Heritage, the American Enterprise Institute, you saw a strategy on the right of creating a whole uh, set of research organizations whose role was to produce right wing viewpoint confirmation throughout the story. Now, some of them are very, uh, uh, very politically mobilized and specific, like Judicial Watch uh, uh, or, or, or like uh, uh, the Mercer-funded, uh, um, Bannon co-founded uh, uh, Government Accountability Initiative. And some of them are much more serious think, think tanky type things. Those really do operate in a way that's very different from academia. And again, there's this imbalance where when you're inside a framework that depends on politically aligned donors and you don't have the institutional constraints of academia, you certainly do see much more motivated research. It's not that you don't do see academically mobilized research in the academia as well, in the university as well. But here you get institutional constraints that at least for the more serious research impose a much more serious constraint. So on that level of high, uh, uh, high quality uh, data informed narratives that come into the media, I think your, your dynamic of money making a difference is important. On the media culture itself, I really do think it was a transformation of the business model to allow for advertising-based hate-stoking outrage industry to emerge. Um, one of the things that I feel like um, that, that, that technology has changed in some way, I mean, and I'm looking back at 2004, was there was a, there was a meme in, two, <clears throat> in 2004, which was Drudge Rules Their World. <clears throat> and that was... That was to articulate the efficacy of the sort of the way that these the um, the the right wing narratives sort of entered into the uh, society's bloodstream in some way that it would it would go from Fox News or, um, you know, some of these, uh, you know, sort of like quasi think tank uh, institutions through Drudge and then every producer at, you know, ABC News, NBC News, CBS News at CNN would read Drudge and they and Drudge would basically provide them the um, the the their editorial decisions of the day. And on some to some degree, it seems like that social media in particular, but even starting with the blogs, started to push back on that in some way. And the dynamic change to where that, the, it was almost as if there was a realization amongst the right that, like, we don't even need to have the ABCs, CBSs, and NBCs buy this story anymore, uh, largely. We can just sort of maintain this narrative in our own bubble. We don't even need it to be validated anymore by the broader society. And yet we still saw an example of like Steve Bannon going out and laundering uh, Clinton cash through the organization that you just you just cited. Um, what, can you tell me about that dynamic, about about how on one hand the right seems to be now sort of self-sufficient in terms of the narrative 
And in other instances, we still have these this sort of like mainstreaming of of w what essentially function as right wing conspiracies. So this is actually a really important point. But before I even start that, you mentioned Drudge. Drudge is still critically important. If you look at similar web uh, uh, traffic at, at one of the web traffic analysis firms, um, it looks like something like half of Alex Jones's InfoWars traffic comes from links from Drudge. Much more important than Facebook uh, uh, or Twitter or any other source for, for uh, InfoWars. So Drudge is still important within that uh, uh, ecosystem in a, in a really quirky way. But you asked, I think, a more important question, which is the role of mainstream traditional media in disseminating the crazy uh, on the right. And I think it's our book, we have a, a, a chapter dedicated to failures of mainstream media. We have a chapter uh, specifically around um, um, the ways in which, as you describe, um, 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 Breitbart and Bannon use the New York Times. The thing that's important to remember is that even though we don't know exactly how many people live fully inside the feedback loop, that's not the entire Republican electorate. So if you look, for example, at surveys and the question of, is the press the enemy of the people? It's shocking that 51% of Republicans in August of 2018 tell the Quinnipiac poll that they think that the press is the enemy of the people. But at the same time, that's only half. It's shocking that 48% of Trump voters tell a YouGov uh, poll in December of 2016 that they think that emails showed that someone was running a pedophilia ring out of Clinton's campaign, but it's 48%. There's that roughly half-ish of Republican voters, could be as few, uh, could be as much as 25% as of that population, of, of the population generally, could be as little as 15. We're not quite sure whether a quarter or a third of a population lives squarely inside the Fox News Breitbart universe, but it's certainly not all Republican voters. And this is the critical role that mainstream media played in taking those stories and generalizing to the public, because that's where the people who spend some of their time on Fox News, but much of their time on ABC, CBS, NBC, um, those are the people who really got confounded by mainstream media. So the story uh, that you note, know, the story of, of Clinton Cash, was just a brilliant piece of information operation from Bannon. Literally two years before the election, um, it was clear that he already knew that the, prim that, that the primary contact contenders would be uh, Clinton and Bush and Jeb Bush, and he had um, uh, the Government Accountability Initiative um, uh, wrote a couple of books. One was called Clinton Cash. The other was called Bush Bucks. And they were both basically concocted conspiracies about how horrible, terrible, no good each one of these two families were in terms of, of um, uh, selling the store of American politics uh, for donors. In the case of Clinton, it was primarily Clinton Foundation. The trick... With, Clinton, with the Clinton Foundation, was to then come and give the New York Times an exclusive, 18 months before the election, an exclusive. So the Times went, they read the book, they followed up, and they came out with a big story. And the story had a blaring headline, cash flows to Clinton Foundation amid um, a transfer of uranium um, uh, uh, to, to Russian firms. Sounds terrible. Somewhere in paragraph 15 or 17, there's buried, there was no evidence wrongdoing, but still it raises issues. That story became the third most linked to story in the entire campaign story. A story from April of 2015 became the, most, uh, the third most linked to story of all the time stories throughout the entire election period. Wow. Because it was used by the right to reinforce and confirm and get a sense of validation for this story. So again, we document over and over again how the right-wing outlets are essentially teasing and 
putting things into the stream of mainstream media. The, the email releases had the same effect. And it's the inability of editors to keep the headlines consistent with the facts and the wish to sort of draw people in that ends up amplifying and validating this conspiracy stories that come from the right. So what is, if you have it, uh, what is the solution to this? Or, or what is, what, is there anything out there that can mitigate this dynamic? I mean, how do you pierce a bubble like that? So first of all, uh, we start ruefully the chapter on solutions with uh, if our diagnoses had been simpler and more technical, we would have been able to give you better technocratic solutions. Uh, right. These are deep structural problems of political culture and media culture. Uh, there are no easy solutions. I would say that the single most important thing that can happen and we don't have this in the book yet because uh, the, the data uh, stopped at the beginning of 2018. But impressionistically, it seems like this is getting through to editors and, and, and newsrooms. The most important thing is that traditional professional journalists and editors need to understand that they are in a deeply asymmetric propaganda system and that when they are propagating the stories from the right, uh, they are essentially complicit. So the old model of playing objectivity in traditional media was to be neutral. Side says this, says that, side that, said the other thing, and I'm just telling you how about what both sides says. When you have such grammatic asymmetry, to be objective by being neutral systematically makes you someone who validates falsehood from the right. And so you need to change the culture. And you're seeing already uh, media willing to call out lies from the president, in particular from, from Trump, uh, in a way that would have been inconceivable five years ago. Also, we have levels of lying that would have been inconceivable five years ago. So that's, that's obviously uh, uh, pushing it. But so you need a change in professional media culture. That's the most important thing. Uh, ultimately, it will require sustained losses by the Republicans so that they realize that it's a losing strategy and begin to work things back on their own. But that's obviously uh, out of the hands of anybody trying to create solutions. There are discrete things we can do. I think there's no doubt that we need immediate, substantial uh, reform to introduce transparency into political advertising. The one thing we don't know is how effective the Facebook targeted advertising was for the Trump campaign in particular, and in particular, how much uh, dark ads, essentially ads that only very, very narrow sets of people see. So there are proposals like the Honest Ads Act that are on the table. Those won't solve the whole problem, but they're an important basic infrastructure for us to know uh, what's going on. Uh, we need some accountability uh, for the platforms, greater transparency to what's going on. Um, and there's some initiatives primarily in Europe now uh, around creating those. I doubt that those will come out in the U.S. soon. Uh, so we need to focus on the platforms because within 5, 10, 15 years, they will be the dominant source. But because so much of what's central now is happening still on cable TV and on radio, uh, it's very hard to come up with solutions that are consistent with the First Amendment other than this main shift in the practices of journalists and editors. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what scares me is that I think it I think that the changes that we've seen in those journalists has been a function of Trump. But when we see like just for this, you know, this weekend where we see things like Rick Scott saying, you know, starting to talk about fraud in Florida and um in fact, you know, this is getting repeated and they're allowing Republican politicians uh, and others to repeat this, even though Rick Scott himself has not called the police. He's the governor. He has the ability to investigate these things. I get a little worried that Trump allows the media to sort of say, like, hey, look, we're being we're, we're doing that. We're, we're being skeptical. But then just sort of like leave it to just as if it was a Trump phenomena rather than the the 
entire structure of a machine that brought Trump really to where he was, right? Like the machine preceded Trump, right? I mean, that's you you had to have a machine Absolutely. that 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 would that where that was telling its both its producers and its consumers, hey, Barack Obama may not be an American for Trump to sort of ride that wave um, into office in some way. I think that's exactly right. I think although Trump is both a symptom of a much longer outrage industry and a catalyst, Uh, you can't ignore and we show it in the data, particularly in the chapter on immigration. uh, He he has this call and response relationship with uh, right wing media ecosystem, as well as with the mainstream media. And he is a real catalyst. He's not the source of the problem. He is definitely a symptom of years of the propaganda feedback loop on the right operating as we describe it. But he has certainly learned how to not only be a consequence, but be a real catalyst. And he and and he's you can't ignore the fact that he's made things much worse and he's essentially made it into the official policy of the United States to call the media uh, the enemy of the people. Um, but I, I agree with you that, that he makes it too easy, that in some sense uh, professional journalists um, um, have not quite focused on how pervasive this phenomenon is in the Republican Party. And look, the more Trump succeeds with it, the more politicians on the right will follow right. him. People follow success. It'll have to show itself as a failure. And even the debate over whether or not the midterm was a blue wave or not is precisely a debate on whether the Trump strategy was a success or a failure. And I think the, the, the sense that somehow the sense that emerged in the first day and that slowly we're learning was false, that there was no blue wave has allowed him to continue to project this persona of a success. And as long as he's a success, people on the right will try to follow and copy him. I just uh, I appreciate your hanging with me for so long. A couple more questions. I just found this really fascinating. How do we know, you know, like um, wh- how do we know the power of cable news and of these narratives in terms of like, uh, uh, I mean, I think it's it's easier to understand how they impact our politics in terms of like almost legislatively, because many of the politicians themselves they're they're bathed in this. But when we talk about cable news, for instance, you know, we're talking about, I don't know, a whole universe of of five or 10 million people, maybe who who watch all this stuff. Um, And, you know, and and shows like this one. I mean, there's not. But how how do we know that that actually has that it makes a difference? Like, you know, when we rail on somebody for for trafficking in in, in some type of conspiracy how what, how do we know from the data that this makes any type of difference or how does that manifest itself so there are two ways one is not stuff that we do we just survey it from others and that's survey so uh, Pew goes out and asks uh, uh, voters what is your primary source of news or what news source do you most trust And there you get very clearly that when Pew, right after the election, asked uh, uh, asked Trump voters, what news sources do, what is your most important news source, 40% said um, Fox. Uh, Only about 7% said Facebook. So you know that Fox is much more important. On the left, just as we found with our own data, In the same survey, you see a much longer and smoother distribution of attention with uh, with other sites. Similarly, in our own data, if you look at um, uh, attention, so take the Seth Rich conspiracy, the conspiracy that that, uh, DNC staffer rather than uh, uh, leaked the DNC memos, rather than that the Russians hacked it. Right after Seth Rich was murdered, in Washington, D.C. as part of a robbery, there was a bubbling on the net of various fringe sites, maybe Russian-inspired sites, uh, that was trying to say, no, it was Seth Rich, it wasn't anybody else. Uh, There was a moment where it spiked a little bit, 
around uh, WikiLeaks releasing a, a uh, prize for whoever kills and therefore implying that, in fact, he was the source. When you plot the amount of attention it got overall online during that early period when the more uh, online extreme and WikiLeaks-only uh, uh, propagation happened, to a period uh, on the week in which Comey was fired when Hannity and Fox and Friends and uh, Fox DC even propagated the same conspiracy theory, that later time dwarfs several times over the amount of coverage and, and attention online mm. there was to uh, the fringe. And we see this again with the Uranium One story that was part of what we talked about with regard right. to uh, the Bannon Breitbart. That happened the same thing. It was big, but it was overwhelmed in November of 2017 when things were going badly in the Mueller investigation for Trump, when suddenly Fox News, morning, noon, and night for a month, took on this Uranium One story, completely recoded it as a story about how Mueller and Rod Rosenstein and Andrew McCabe had helped Obama give the Russians 20% of American nuclear capabilities. I kid you not. No, Is that no. crazy? Uh, no, no. I, I know that story explodes. well. It's sad to say. So when you look... So when you look at, 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 at our measures of attention online, it's very clear that when it makes it in a big way to Fox, it dominates what happens when it stays only online. Yeah. So that gives us a real level of confidence when you combine both the surveys of what people say they care about and the measures of what they search, Google Trends or whatever it is that we're using, uh, that, that cable is really driving these beliefs. I mean, I would imagine. I mean, certainly we saw that with the caravan too, and I would imagine that there is, um, and I'm sure it's been done in the past, and maybe we'll see it with this. There will be data that associates uh, Fox will explain why there were sort of d disparate types of people reacting to one message or another in the context of these midterms. All right. So, lastly, let me just ask you this, because when I when I talked about what can be done, uh, you know, uh, much of it relied on the producers to um, to responsibly, you know, uh, assess, you know, the w w what they were going after. And like I say, with the caravan, we, we saw that completely break down. Right. Like there nobody's covering the caravan anymore because um, there really is not a, a a terribly relevant story to the American public. about. There never it. was. And there never was. I mean, to the extent that there was any, it was just like. These guys are saying the caravan's important. We're not going to go down to the caravan because the caravan in itself is not important. We're just covering how these guys are saying, you know, a ghost is important. And they didn't even they weren't even able to uh, to provide that type of restraint. So aside from relying on those on the producers, um, what can like the consumer or let's say citizens um, can do? Is there anything that they can do, or is it just like, let's hope for better editors? <laughs> um, so it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, uh, in a universe where you think that everybody is confused and doesn't know what the truth is, you say, teach yourself, lead a more diverse diet, and all of that. In a universe that's consistent with our results, people don't not know. They know what they're getting. That people who consume conspiracy theories are not, or particularly not so much conspiracy theories at the extreme, but, but just the mainstream Fox News driven uh, outrage. The people who consume that enjoy it. It's entertainment. It makes yeah. you feel good about yourself. To come to somebody and say, no, the thing you believe, remember in, in a Pew report, when you ask consistently liberal people, consistently conservative people, what their most trusted news outlets were, they said Fox News, Hannity, Limbaugh, and Glenn Beck. They trust them. They pay attention to them. It makes them feel good about themselves to listen to them. What are you going to tell them? You're wrong. You should change. You should uh, 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 let go of everything that gives you meaning and makes you happy. Uh, uh, because it's inconsistent with reality, as I understand it. Uh, I don't know that there's a solution based on, on, on users, on, on, on readers and viewers. I think people are stuck 
in the system they're stuck, in the structure that they're stuck. And if you can identify levers where you can change the structure, then people might slowly start to climb down off the limb they're on. And in that regard, the most important people are the people who are not yet fully in the grip of the Fox News Breitbart universe, but are only one foot in. Those are the people who, in some sense, can still be brought back to something like reality. And that needs to be the initial focus in my view. The book is Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation, and Radicalization in American Politics, uh, authored by Yochai Benkler and uh, co-authors Robert Farris, Hal Roberts. We will put a link to that at majority.fm. Professor, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time today. Thank you. It was lovely to spend time with you. All right, folks. Eesh. Uh, so there you have it. See you in a year. I don't know <laughs> what. Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, um, it. One of the things I think that we try and do here is, you know, grab those people before they just fall down that rabbit hole. I still contend that, um, you know, uh, if anybody wants to give me uh Ten million dollars, I will uh, do some leases on some low-powered FM stations in some uh, in half a dozen states, and we'll get this uh, we'll get this thing going. Oh, get AM stations too. That's what I'm saying. Low-powered. Did I say FM? Yeah. Oh, I meant um, yes. Low-powered AM stations. Both. I would even go the before above. the FM. I would I would go AM first. I don't know why I said FM. I but, was I was taking notes. Because I feel like the left should be radicalizing people, too, with our media. But uh, we care a little more about the truth. So that's a problem. That is the problem. I mean, that is the problem. Um, We you do not see. And here is a solution. Did you hear that new Ted Cruz story? Oh, we'll get to in the fun half. Oh, well, there you go. Mm. Uh, Baseless speculation and innuendo. It would be do that. Uh, at one point, it was a meme back in the day, uh, even pre-meme. It would be irresponsible not to speculate, uh, is what we used to say. <laughs> I can't that remember. That is such a dick it, line. It, it actually came from a, a, a right-wing outlet, or I can't remember if it was the Bush administration. Somebody said that. Uh, that it would be irresponsible. It's Bob speculate. Garfield of On the Media. And uh, I, I don't think it was. Um, Folks, we're going to head into the uh, fun half. Just a reminder, this program relies on on you, on you who is listening. Maybe not you today, maybe you yesterday, or maybe you tomorrow, but maybe you today. It is our members who make this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com, jointhemajorityreport.com. When you go there, spend a couple of, couple of bucks a week supporting this program. We say thank you by giving you extra content every day, and we're able to uh, to push this show along. I'm work. I'm looking into technology right now. Now we were just speaking to Yochai B- uh, Benkler in he was in Spain, and so we we you know we talked to him on the on the cell phone, and it was uh, the the sound was not optimal. There's only so much we can do. I can't uh, arrange to have Yochai Benkler go to um, a, you know, an NPR studio in, uh, in Spain. But there are, are technologies we're looking at that might, might help um, with that. And so when you become a member, that's what we do. We pour it into it, um, into trying to, to make the show uh, better in some fashion for you. So again, join the majority report.com tomorrow on this program. We'll have a special announcement about a way in which you could see us in the flesh. As you know, Michael's doing a show, uh, TMBS in, uh, in Brooklyn in February. Um, and I have, because of a court order, I can't go anywhere near that building for, uh, for like a couple of days before. And like, uh, like literally, there's a whole circumference that I'm like a radius that I'm not. Oh, it's to too bad. I was actually hoping to offer you I, a, probably like a half price ticket. I thought 
<laughs> if you want I to did. come sit in the audience. That's the way he says it in this, but uh, we're researching who filed that uh, restraining order. So with that said. Um, who? Whoa. Sorry. I thought of actually a funny line, but I, I'm impressed with how I restrained myself from saying it. Well, here you go. Uh, but we will have an, uh, an but announcement. But it would be irresponsible to not speculate, speculate as to who that joke might have been about. Um, I but, don't even want to go there. Yeah, yeah, um, but uh, we'll have an announcement uh, tomorrow on this program. Uh, join the majority report.com. Also, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, TMBS, uh, you're actually going to do some work this week. Indeed. Uh, two different shows this week. And tomorrow, Malaika Jabali is joining us. She has a really good piece in Current Affairs called The Color of Economic Anxiety, which deals with a New York Times profile on African-American voters that didn't go out and vote in 2016 and rebranding what we mean when we talk about the working class. It follows up with the Bill Fletcher Jr. conversation very well. Plus a mini uh, primer, which will lead to illicit history on what happened in Florida in 2000. And then on Friday, crew, Corey Pine is back along with ContraPoint. She'll be joining us. And uh, so and I'll talk about this more as the week goes on. And definitely uh, get your tickets to the show for February 1st at the Bell House. Can't wait to see you there. The tickets are link is available on the homepage of majority.fm. Jamie. Yeah, so out now on the Antifada, we have an interview with Jay Firestone, who wrote an amazing piece for Commune magazine that's going a bit viral called Three Months Inside Alt-Right New York about his secret mission infiltrating various alt-right and uh, alt-light groups like the Proud Boys, uh, gathering information on them. We talked about what the experience was like for him, who these people are, how the groups interact with each other, how they view Trump, as well as various kinds of anti-fascist tactics, and why only communism can fight fascism in the long run. Matt. Uh, Hope Leslie finally did the episode on Hope Leslie, a book by Catherine Maria Sedgwick, uh, 1827. Uh, check it out. It's on YouTube, uh, patreon.com slash literary hangover. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. Headed to the fun half. 646-257-3920 is the number. See you in the fun half. <laughs> 